This is uh, the next to last week of content in the foundational part of the course. Um, you actually, at this point, uh, as of learning how to use dplyr fully, have a pretty good foundation on which to build specific skill sets. So you can actually use R for a lot of stuff at this point. Um, the project will demonstrate this to you a little bit. Uh, you'll be looking at uh, developing a data pipeline uh, that will um, uh, very closely resemble the kind of thing that you would do in a real project. Uh, and two weeks from now, we will, or three weeks, I guess, since we're off for a week, um, but two sets of content from now, we will start doing statistical tests uh, using these systems. So, uh, yeah, we're getting, we're getting into some real-life kind of stuff now. This particular week, we are talking about data manipulation, and I hope that you recognize that in this material, you have not necessarily learned to do anything new. What instead you've learned is how to do things easier than the way you were doing them before. So most of the functions that you did this time uh, can be done in base R. It just you have to use, make heavy use of dollar notation. Uh, you have to you make heavy use of apply family, which is not super intuitive. Uh, it is still useful, um, and you will still need to use the apply family for certain things. Uh, but dplyr really streamlines a lot of the analyses that you commonly do, uh, especially mutate. Mutate in particular is going to be very valuable for us uh, in the context of doing things like calculating scale scores. That's something fairly actually not intuitive as to how you would do that uh, in base R, but it's actually pretty straightforward at dplyr. So, uh, yeah, so we'll go through all of these kind of issues today. We're going to start with, uh, again, a couple of notes on base R, what base R uh, things that you learned this week that are in base R, but it didn't make very clear was base R. Uh, it seemed like a couple of things that you did might have been part of dplyr when they really weren't. Uh, then we're going to cover the dplyr functions that you learn in a good deal of depth. And I'm also going to end this with a warning about dplyr, because uh, dplyr is the first time that we have really fully dived into a package with lots of different functions rather than just pick and choosing individual little pieces. And once you start doing that, once you start relying on packages, you have to start worrying about some other things in R. Um, that you don't have to worry about in places like SPSS quite so much. So we'll talk about that at the end. Uh, so we talked, uh, there was a, a bit in the end of the first course, I think, or maybe, yeah, I think it was the end of the first course. We talked about data types in a little bit more detail. Um, I just uh, wanted to re-emphasize a couple of things that you might not necessarily have noticed or have thought really in depth about. One is there are no single numbers stored in variables. They do not exist. Even when you do this, when you do A gets one, what you're really doing is creating a vector of length one. There are no just numbers stored anywhere in R. That's one of the things that's weird about R. That is an unusual aspect of R that is really, and again, highlights that optimization for statistical analyses, because in statistics, you very rarely need a number for something. Uh, but that makes it unusual in comparison to others. Again, I've said this a lot of times, I don't know if I ever wrote it down, data frames are lists of vectors that act like matrices, which is weird, but that's what it is. If you do the class of a data frame, it will come back as a list. The only way that you can check whether or not a data frame is actually a data frame is to use a separate command called is.data.frame. Uh, and that will give you back true-false, just like uh, the other is functions will. But it, it, a data frame is a list. So if you see a function that works on lists, that means that you can give it data frames. And that's a very important piece of it. Um, that was uh, particularly important in the dplyr context when we're talking about how to convert lists of data frames into a single data frame, uh, which was one of the exercises this week uh, in the, in the uh, data game. This part, do not try to memorize coercion rules. There was a significant amount of content on what coerces to what in, in what circumstances. Uh, it is a just horrible, nightmarish mess of nonsense to try to figure all that out. What instead I would recommend you do is use local testing, which means drop to the console and just type things out. I've showed you examples of that a few times in here. Uh, Use dplyr because dplyr, when it coerces something, will warn you. Uh, and be aware that it occurs and look for the situations where it is likely to happen. Factors in particular are problematic in R. So th when things get converted to and from factors, they don't always convert the way you might think they would. 
Uh, that's especially important if you start mix and matching imports and other functions. So if you import using base R, if you do like a read.csv and forget to use strings as factors, and then you convert that into a tibble, and that reconverts all the, all the types, then you can end up with something just that doesn't look like what you originally started with. So it's just real important, check everything. Only write code one line at a time. Remember, code development, not code writing. When you do code development, write one line at a time, test it, make sure it did what you think it did. Go check your environment variables, make sure the data frame looks like what you think it should look like, uh, and uh, only do it a piece at a time. Over time, you'll develop an intuitive sense of where coercion occurs and where to worry about it, but right now, I would not worry about memorizing it. Uh, classes. We've talked about classes, but we're starting to get a little bit more into it um, in a little more depth. A class is essentially a vector of information with special characteristics. So uh, POSIX, for example, is a class because what POSIX does is it actually stores a whole lot of information that is not just the number you see. It stores uh, essentially a vector of attributes, and those attributes define how that variable can be used. There are built-in classes, which is you know list and uh, matrix, et cetera, uh, and data frame. But we are adding new classes now, and that's going to become increasingly important as we move further. So tibble is a class, for example, uh, and tibble data frame is also a class, tbl and tbl underscore df. So if you ever use the class function on a tibble, you'll find it has three classes, tibble, tibble data frame, and data frame. So each of those define the kind of things you can do with it. And that's also how R knows that a data frame is not just a list, because it's part of a class called data frame that gives you that information. Uh, factors, factors is horrible. I, I would really recommend not using factors until you absolutely need them. Uh, in, we will need them in a few contexts here, especially because uh, base R, like ANOVA functions, for example, expect you to have factors as your grouping variable. But in general, I would really recommend you just keep them as strings until you explicitly need a factor and then convert it at that point. <coughs> Part of the reason this is also coming up now is because we're increasingly getting to a point where there are uh, essentially an infinite number of ways to do things. I mentioned before, we start with survival phrases and we move more into language. Now we're at language. Uh, for any given thing that you've learned how to do, you should know probably at least two or three ways to do it. In some cases, seven or eight different ways to do it. Uh, and once we get to the end of the course, you will have dozens of ways to do any one particular thing. So a lot of this is about developing an intuitive sense of uh, an intuitive sense of which way makes the most sense given a particular situation. And we saw some examples of that in the projects last week, um, where people might have done things in a non-optimal way, but still worked. Uh, and you can do that. Uh, it's just the optimal way is going to be faster, uh, and it's going to be uh, it's going to be easier to read later, which is also a big piece. Read labeling text. This came up in the beginning of the first course, uh, but wasn't explicitly labeled as being a base R function. It sounded an awful lot like uh, it was part of dplyr, but it's not. Uh, the basic idea is if you want to create uh, this kind of thing right here. You know what this is called? What kind of data type, what class is this right here? It's a kind of vector. It's real obvious when you, uh, when you think about it. This is called a named vector. Named vectors have what are called key value pairs, where individual keys are what is actually located in the data, and then the value is what is displayed to you. In SPSS terms, this is kind of the same as when you have a nominal or categorical variable that has a value in your data set, but then you go over into that values tab and define something else. That's what this is. So a named vector, uh, is essentially one in which you have both keys and values. In this case, we have a key of A and a value of experimental, a key of B and a value of control. When you relabel vectors, it's important to understand what's happening. And you did this, but I didn't think it did a super great job of explaining what was happening. Um, you created a variable called LUT, which stands for lookup table. Uh, and what a lookup table is, is a named vector that contains these pairs for all the values in another vector. So in your data set, you might have ones, twos, and threes. Now you wouldn't have ones, twos, and threes. You might have A, Bs, and Cs, but you want those As, Bs, and Cs to be something else. And that's especially uh, valuable of a, of a thing to know when you want to change like labels on graphs, uh, because otherwise it would use A, B, C, and if you want to change the labels, you might need to, uh, to use name vectors. And it gave you this function as a way to do that, as a way to recast 
this vector as these names. Okay, do you remember doing that? It was really toward the beginning. Uh, this is a weird structure. If you don't think, if you don't think about it very much, you're like, well, wait a minute. Why am I looking in the lookup table at the positions of my own data? That's a reverse way to think about this. I don't understand why that happened. So I'm, I, I, most, you probably just clicked on past this and didn't think too much about it, but I think it's important that you recognize what's happening here. Because what it's doing is it's taking your named vector and then it's saying for each of these locations in that vector, return a value. So it says, well, in the C vector, look at location A. Well, location A is experimental, so item one becomes experimental. Location two is also an A. Well, that's also experimental, so location two becomes experimental. Now, I, uh, value three, look for a B. Well, in our original vector, value B is control, so that returns control. That's how you build a vector of names using a lookup table. But that's why it seems weird. So I just, I want to be very clear. One, this is a base R function. This is not dplyr. This is just how R works. Uh, and two, you're basically reconstructing this vector from your named vector. So it's actually looking up each of these values given the input. So remember that a single bracket is essentially subsetting, right? So it's saying subset A and B by A, A, B, B, B. That's why that works the way it does. Make sense? So we'll need this in certain contexts, so just, just be aware of it. Uh, this is the way that we traditionally do it. You usually save the lookup table as its own variable and then use it on whatever it is you're trying to modify. But it's real important that you recognize that's what's happening, that longer expression. Okay. Now we get into, now we get into tidyverse. Uh, so, the core of tidyverse, the core function is what's called a tibble. And a tibble is a data frame. Period. It is a data frame. However, it also has extra features that make it a little easier to work with, which are these items right here. Uh, one, it does not change types. So when we did uh, imports into... Uh, data frames before, we would usually need to put strings as factors at the end in order to make sure that it came back as a character vector. And for example, when we did dates, it came back as like a 200 level variable with every date being its own level. So we use strings as factors to avoid that. Well, you always need to use strings as factors to avoid that. Uh, strings as factors equals false to avoid that. So the tidyverse does this by default. It also does it when converting between different vectors, which is important. Easier to work with lists uh, than it is in data frames. In data frames, uh, uh, we haven't done this yet, but we will. Uh, you might have nested lists inside lists as a way to do nested data. So we could, for example, have a data frame inside a data frame. That's uh, real hard to do in base R. You can, but the notation gets really wonky, uh, and tibbles make that significantly easier. And you did one example of that uh, where you combined uh, a list of five data frames into a single data frame using Unite, I think. Um, so that's an example of that. It does not arbitrarily change column names. This is a thing we haven't faced because I've been giving you nice, pretty, easy to format data sets. But when you work with real data, weird things start happening. Uh, if you have spaces, like if you had, for example, a column name called my space name, that gets converted to my dot name by base R. Spaces, special characters, all sorts of weird stuff gets changed and it does it silently. It does not tell you that it did it. So if you think you imported something with a certain name, even if you gave it that name with a space in the columns name vector to import it, it will still change it later until, because it doesn't want you to have spaces in the name. This is sort of like the old SPSS restrictions if you used old SPSS where you can only have like eight characters and it, so you couldn't start it with a number and there are all sorts of weird rules. Those rules are still here. <laughs> So in base R, when you import, it'll, it'll enforce that, but won't tell you it's done. It'll just change the name without telling you. Uh, when you use tibbles, it does not do that. So that's why it's important to use, for, and why we last time emphasized using read underscore CSV instead of using read dot CSV and then converting it to a tibble, because you actually lose information when you do it that way. Uh, evaluates arguments sequentially is super important. Uh, and I'll give you an example of what that means uh, in R. So if I were, let's create a data frame, and I think I already have one. Yes, I do. If I were to take my data frame and I were to mutate it 
in order to create a new variable, let's call it uh, x plus y, gets xxx plus yyy, and you can see those two up there. It's just a vector of 1 through 5 and a vector of 2 through 10. Uh, I can then define something else afterward. I can say, for example, um, uh, xpy squared equals xpy squared. Oh, well, we need a library type first. There we go. And that will create that uh, vector for you. Now, if I tried to do that as a data frame definition, if I went to uh, new data frame, gets data dot frame, vector one is, or well, name it, x gets one, two, three, and y gets four, five, six. That should work. Yep. I can create that like that, but if I try to do it this way, x, y gets x times y, it will not work. And the reason for that is because right now, when it gets to this piece, x and y do not exist yet in data frame. However, I believe if I do it as a tibble, it works just fine. So this is an important piece of this. Tibble evaluates sequentially. It goes one, two, three, straight in order across all the things that you're doing. When you do data frame definitions, it does not. That's especially important in contexts where you might be dropping or adding variables as you go. If you're just doing one variable at a time, it's not going to matter. But if you're doing sequences of variables in one statement, it does matter a lot. Okay. Uh, does not allow row names. One of the things that you can do in base R, we haven't done it because it's a terrible thing to do and you should never do it, is you can assign a name to a row. Uh, I think some of the default ones may have that, some of the default uh, data sets, yes. So this is a super confusing data set called MTCars. It's built into R. If you type MTCars, you will find this data set. You will notice this first column right here does not have a name. This is a stupid thing to do. You should not do that. What they have done is just like I have column labels, I also have row labels here. So I could actually search for individual rows using the standard R notation with the brackets. But instead of comma, quote something, I would do quote something, comma, right? And I could look up individual rows of this data set. That is not a good way to handle data. That is not something you should be doing. Tibbles enforces that idea by getting rid of the row names. It will not let you have row names. They will automatically be stripped out if you try to add them. Because it goes to this philosophy that you probably internalize uh, coming from uh, a social science psych kind of background, which is every row is an independent observation of some larger thing. So you have a sample and you have 50 cases. So there's nothing unique or special about any particular case in a data set. Uh, that's different from how R was kind of originally designed uh, and S, which R is based on. Uh, this idea that you might be subsetting data to individual rows and doing all sorts of nonsense. Don't do any of that. So if you use a tibble, this will be removed. You will have no row names. You can't refer to row names. You shouldn't refer to row names. And even if you don't use uh, dplyr, you shouldn't use row names. But that's just to emphasize, if you ever see what you think is a column disappear when you convert to a tibble, that's because they were row names and not an actual column. Uh, when you display one, it gives you more useful information. So if I uh, look at a uh, my underscore tibble, you will see I get back fee information about uh, if they, I don't get back when I look at the data frame. I get one, it's defined as a tibble. I get a five row, four column, I get the names of the variables across, I get their data types, and I get the first ten rows or so by default. That is very different than what a data frame gives you back uh, most of the time. So if I, actually I'm not sure if I can coerce this this way, we'll find out. Oh, I can. When I just get back uh, tibble uh, as data frame, I will get, uh, number one, I have row numbers, which in this case look weird um, for a reason unrelated to, because that's how it was designed. You get back the row names, which they've reappeared in this weird order. You get uh, a basic summary, you get no types, you get uh, no summary information. So tibbles get back this little bit of extra data that you otherwise don't get. So that's another difference. And again, I will uh, show you this, how a tibble is really three classes simultaneously. Tibble DF, tibble, and data frame, if you've never checked that. Uh, 
subsetting consistently returns tibbles. That is a real important thing. If I do my tibble one, I get back the first variable in tibble. If I do as dot data frame my tibble one, we get back, oh, it's because I did it that way. Uh, if I do it that way, I end up getting back a vector rather than a data frame. So when I subset this way, it coerces it down the same way S apply coerces down to the simplest possible format. In this case, it's a vector. Tibbles will never under any circumstances do that. Tibbles will always give you tibbles. So that's important because within the tidyverse, remember that basically every function takes a tibble, like mutate and separate and the, uh, all, all of the functions that we talked about, glimpse, spread, like all of it. They always take tibbles. So that means you never have to worry that something is down converted without you expecting it. This happens to be a big issue a lot in base R. Sometimes these, these uh, will convert classes without telling you, and functions won't work, and you'll be like, but that is a data frame. I don't understand why it didn't work. And the reason is because R actually converted it from a data frame to something else without telling you. So tibbles always return tibbles, and that's uh, very valuable. And finally, extraction requires complete column names. These guys right here uh, are how you course as.tibble, as.tibble, and as underscore data underscore frame. Uh, the way that you check is that tibble and is that tibble. Uh, one of the odd things that happens uh, that we're going to talk about a little bit later is some of the resources that you have in DataCamp are actually slightly out of date. Uh, and when you did, when DataCamp was written, these two functions did not yet exist. So that's why you learned as underscore data underscore frame. Uh, but all of these now work in the current version of dplyr. When you define data frames, you should be using tibble parentheses instead of data dot frame parentheses. Uh, so this is just a way to automatically go straight to tibble. Now dplyr, uh, what dplyr really is uh, advantageous for is that it will, uh, it uses this concept called uh, verbs. And what a verb is, is really a single function that does something to a data frame and, or to a tibble and returns a tibble back. So the five common ways that you would do this is column subsetting, row subsetting, row sorts, uh, new column creation, and summaries. And understanding the relationship between all those is how you create interesting and powerful chains of commands that give you the kind of output that you need. This week's project is largely about creating these kind of chains. The important thing to remember uh, in doing this are these functions, not necessarily the names of them, because the different names do slightly different things. Uh, and we also haven't yet learned a variety of variations on these terms that are, uh, are useful. Um, instead, you should just remember these kind of functions. Column and row subsetting, sorting, new column creation, and new summary tables. The important distinction between these first four and this last one is uh, what I just said. These first four create variables in data frames. They take an existing data frame, they change something about it, or an existing tibble, change something about it, and then return the changed tibble. That is not what the summary functions do. The summary functions do some sort of operation on your tibble and create a brand new tibble without any of the raw content of the first. So if I mutate in a uh, tibble, it will create a new column and all my other columns will still be there. If I summarize and I only summarize on two variables, all of my other variables are gone. I created a brand new tibble that has nothing to do directly with the original content of the first one. Does that make sense? This is really easy to see uh, in the data wrangling cheat sheet that I've shown you a couple times, um, the one that's linked, is that you can see uh, with reshaping, we've already talked about uh, subsetting. Uh, you can see the example here, it's looking at specific rows, turning a few rows in a data set into a bigger data set. Uh, subsetting columns, taking uh, certain columns in a data set and creating a new data set. Uh, summarizing, though, does this. It takes a large number of, uh, of, of rows and it creates a smaller number of rows and a smaller number of columns if you don't tell it to. So if you, tell it, if you have a, a data set with 10 variables in it and you tell it to summarize two, you're only getting two back. That's different than the way the other functions work. 
Uh, we also have these window functions like mutate, uh, which basically take an existing data set or existing column, change it, and return that other column in place of the original if you tell it to. Uh, that's what transmute does. Or it just adds it, which is what mutate does. Okay? So understanding that summarize is different is very important. And you went through a lot of examples of this. I'm just trying to make it very explicit. Uh, this idea that you do not get back the original data set when you do any summary function. As soon as a summary appears in your pipe, in your string of commands that you're running, that you no longer have access to the original data set. It's, it's gone. Okay. Uh, examples here, uh, as you can see, with select for column selection, uh, we have helper functions like contains and matches. Uh, these helper functions are super duper useful. Uh, right here, we end up with uh, the ability to use starts with is particularly important in a social science context because you will often in um, things like Qualtrics uh, or any sort of survey software, you'll get back a data set where you'll have something like V1 through V300. So being able to specify all V's or all V1's or that kind of thing becomes a really useful way to get specific parts of the data set if you, if you want to do it that way. Uh, so uh, that's, that's a very useful function. Uh, you also might, if you go through the manual, uh, who uses Qualtrics? Does everybody use Qualtrics? Sorry, kind of. Half-ish, okay. So uh, one of the things that you can do in any sort of survey software, um, of which Qualtrics is one example, uh, is that you can relabel your variables by their name. So uh, one of the most, one of the easiest things you can do with software like that is to, to pre-specify what variable your columns are in so that they come back the way you expect. So in Qualtrics, you might, for example, have a list of agreeableness items. You might call them agree1 through agree10. Then you can use this helper function to find all the agree variables with one command, rather than having to spot where they all are in your data set. Uh, so this is a really convenient way to refer to stuff if you plan ahead just a little bit. Uh, we have subsetting uh, filters. Uh, distinct and slice, which is oh, okay, right here. Filter is the one that you're most likely going to use. Uh, you're going to probably mutate to create filtering variables, and then you're going to filter on them. This is uh, actually the way SPSS does it. When you go to filter, it creates a new variable, or when you go to select cases or select observations, uh, it creates a new variable called uh, filter underscore dollar sign, and then filters on it. So it's you're just doing it by hand rather than it doing it for you. Uh, so you often mutate and then filter on the basis of a variable you created. Uh, distinct is really useful in a lot of data science stuff we're going to do later. But when you're co connecting multiple different data sets that potentially have overlapping information in them, then distinct allows you to cut out duplicate cases in one command very easily. Uh, you also might want to do slice under certain circumstances. Uh, if you want to just take a subset for testing purposes, for example, you might add a slice command in uh, that does that for you. Or sample underscore n, doesn't really matter. Uh, sorting uses a range, uh, and you'll note the helper verb desk, standing for descending, is always placed around an existing variable, not as its own command. So if I wanted to sort on the basis, let's see if I can see this a little better. If I want to sort on the basis of yyy descending, I might say a range, my tibble descending, yyy. Uh, and I get back the sorted tibble uh, in the opposite direction. But note that desk is not itself a verb. That's a common mistake here, uh, where you think a range means ascending order and desk means descending order. It does not. Um, in fact, you can see what desk does uh, if we do it by hand. It actually just recodes backwards. So that uh, enables you to do a... Uh, a reverse order sorting by converting it that way. So, yep. Creating new columns. I mentioned mutate. Transmute is useful if you don't need the original. So if you are doing a uh, scale mean calculation, for example, if you want to calculate the mean of five scores and you don't want the five scores in your data set anymore, then transmute is what you would want to use. Uh, it just cleans up your data set a little bit. Uh, mutate will do the same thing, but won't drop the variables you used. And then summarize, uh, we already talked about a little bit. Uh, this idea that you get back only an individual um, summary variable. So if I do summarize, and note, uh, in data camp that was summarized with an S, you can do it either way. They're American friendly. Uh, you can summarize uh, my tipple 
and we can get back mean of x. I'm not sure that will has an NA in it, so we have to do remove NA. No, not remove NA. Almost did it. So where's my tipple? Or did I do it backwards again? Yeah, I'll do with that later. So when I did this, uh, what ended up happening? Oh, it's because it's not inside the function. I just figured it out. Man, that's why development is important. Mean y, 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 remove n, a equals true. There we go. That worked. Also, you probably saw this shorthand and didn't realize that you could do this, but you can replace true with t and false with f. Same thing. All of these use the tidy philosophy. So you always specify your tibble first and then whatever your verb is. You are really actively discouraged from subsetting the r way. Uh, the way that we learned first is important because there are situations where you can't use dplyr. Um, but within dplyr, when you're stringing functions together, you're really actively discouraged from doing it this way. You should try to use filter, select, etc. <coughs> try to maintain a data pipeline. Now this concept is, uh, we'll come back to it in a little bit. The idea of the data pipeline is that in your data set, when you're working with your own data uh, and you're processing it through R, you should always have it it designed where in any random person can come in and literally just hit hold control and hit enter, 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 and run through your entire data, your entire script file and reproduce every analysis you did starting from a raw data set. That's the heart of uh, open science. It's the heart of reproducibility. Uh, and reproducibility is not just like a publishing concern. Reproducibility, reproducibility is important just when running analyses. In the I.O. context uh, in particular, you want to be able to, uh, if you later down the road get a legal challenge, be able to show to legal counsel exactly what you did, like literally step by step everything you did. And having a, uh, a, a history of specific commands you've executed is a real convenient way to do that. Uh, in other contexts, it, this really prevents problems associated with mystery data sets, which is an issue that you end up with a lot in, um, in practice. If you're running uh, a lot of little studies, which is a common kind of thing that people with experimental training tend to do, uh, you might run uh, user experience studies or you might run uh, you know, little 20, 30 person studies. You can very easily end up with a huge number of them and not remember exactly why you have 20 data sets in a folder. Uh, this is a real convenient way to have a full history, a working history of literally everything you did and why you did it. Uh, so be, be very mindful of data pipelines and work actively to build them. Common, uh, common problems at this stage. You will need to either remember or check which functions evaluate values and which functions evaluate variables. This is important because up to this point, I've generally been kind of spoon feeding you use this function here. There's going to be less of that as we move forward, and you have to think very carefully about what data type is expected by a function and what it gives back. In this case, for example, is that character evaluates a variable. You give it a variable, and it gives you back a single true or false. Is that in A evaluates values. If I give it a vector, it will give me back one value for every number inside the vector. So is that character takes a vector, returns a value, is that an A takes a vector, returns a vector. Okay? That a distinction happens everywhere. So if you don't remember what a function does and what it returns, it's really important, again, check the documentation because the documentation will tell you. If we go back to um, our help file, and I do help on is.na, then you will see that is.na takes an x, that's an object to be tested, it will take a vector list or pair list, we haven't talked about pair list, but that's okay, and the value that it will give back is an atomic vector of the same length as its argument. So that means a vector returns a vector, a list returns a list, etc. Okay? In contrast, if I go to is.character, test object for type character, it takes an x, that's an object to be tested, and the value it returns is a character of vector of specified length, elements of all vector equals, uh, is that character returns true or false. 
So that is very different than the other one. Is that an A returns a, a object of equal type as what you gave it? Is that character returns true or false? So you're gonna have to start paying attention to this. Uh, otherwise, it's easy to forget. And logically, that should make sense because remember, a vector has a type. A, a number doesn't have a type. So if you really understand the difference between, uh, if you really understand how data are structured in R, that we have vectors and lists and matrices, and that each piece of that has to be one type. A vector can only be one type of data, and that's why we need lists, right? If you remember all of that and that all intuitively makes sense to you, then this should be very obvious. But if it doesn't, then you might need to check for a while. If you forget, the plier will sometimes fail silently and you will be confused. So if, for example, I do this, will this work? Piece it apart. What does what does filter do? Selects rows. That's probably a tibble. And what does this numeric do? Evaluates true or false for what? Which is what data type? Is numeric checks variables, vectors, right? And it returns what they are. So this statement does not make any sense because what it's saying is check to see if the variable x is numeric and then filter rows by that variable. But variables are always one type. So that variable either is numeric or it is not. So this makes no sense. If I wanted to check if a variable was numeric, what should filter be instead? Or I'll be, to be clear, if I want to return variables where this is true, what would I do? Select. So I could use select, my table uh, is numeric, and then a uh, uh, helper function or some other way to do it. Um, and specifically, in this case, uh, we would actually need to use a, a helper select, like select at or select uh, if, but we'll deal with those later. So this would not work. If I wanted to check if a variable was numeric, I could just do that. I could just do is numeric variable name. You don't need to do it in a, within a dplyr command either. Select, filter, arrange, and mutate. And this is just to reiterate what we already talked about. Select, filter, arrange, and mutate, modify existing data sets. Summarize creates new data sets. The only things that you get back will be retained. Some functions drop reference variables after use. This is also important. Uh, certain functions, once you use them, the variables that you use them on will disappear. Transmute is one of those examples. It's a little more explicit. But glimpse and spread do the same thing. Uh, when you use, or not glimpse, that shouldn't be glimpse. It should be spread and uh, gather, sorry. So gather and spread do the same thing. Uh, and what they, when we did that for the last week's project, you'll notice, you would have noticed that all the variables uh, that you referred to went away. They just disappeared and converted over into uh, our new aggregated variables. But that's not really what's happening. What's really happening is it's creating the aggregated variables and then dropping the previous columns. In fact, there are in uh, gather and spread, there is a parameter you can use to tell it not to do that. You can actually inform it, do not drop those columns, just keep them. So all of this is, uh, all of this is changeable. Again, that's the power of R, unlimited flexibility, but you should know what the defaults are. So if something weird happens, you're like, oh, that's because there was a default set and I forgot about it. All right. McGritter. McGritter is a uh, favorite in the data science cast. Uh, McGritter is a package, it's not completely in R, but one piece of it's in R, with, or not in R, one piece of it's in dplyr and tidyverse, which is this guy, the pipe operator. What does the pipe operator do from a technical standpoint? It passes something from the right? Something, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> There we go. So what it'll do is it will take whatever is the output, the return of the function on the left side, it will turn that output 
into a, the first parameter on the right side. So you're passing the, the end result of left-hand side as the first parameter of right-hand side. That is not unique to dplyr. You can use that literally anywhere. So if, uh, if, for example, I wanted to take a vector and calculate a mean, uh, I could do that. So this is not, it is, in, it, it is a tidyverse function, but it is not solely a tidyverse thing. It's not like you can only use this with tidyverse uh, functionality. It will take any output that returns here and feed it as the first parameter of whatever's on the right side. Do note that you need to do this if there are no other parameters, which is why I use this example specifically. I, if you only put mean without the parentheses, then it's going to treat that as the name of the function and it will break. So you still have to specify this to indicate execute the function. That's why you need the parentheses. And then it will pass the value, uh, in this case, the vector 1, 2, 3, as the first parameter of mean. Okay? So the idea in dplyr, uh, really one of the major advantages here is to, uh, oh, there's that example. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the major advantage of uh, doing this is to create chains, uh, what you would, uh, essentially a sequence of pipes that does one block of analyses all on its own. So uh, you might, uh, for example, and I think you did a few of these uh, types of things in, um, in Data Camp. Yeah, you definitely did a few of those. Uh, I might take my.tibble and I might uh, say, uh, well, actually, let's store it first. My.tibble will get my.tibble. I'm going to store it, and then I'm going to say I want to create a new, a new value called p that equals x times y. And then I want to summarize that. Uh, I want mean of p. Oh, I have an x. Ah. There we go. And now I have actually just deleted my tibble, whoops, <laughs> because I saved it back. And I would end up with the mean of that value. I didn't drop uh, missing values again, so it still returned in an A. But you can see that kind of... Um, that kind of pipeline is the kind of thing we're trying to do in dplyr with Magritter. Uh, the idea is really to use this kind of human language in a way that we don't with base R. In base R, you just have a sequence of weird commands to do this. Uh, and in fact, if you were using data.table, uh, remember that's that other thing that we're not using because we're using tidy. Uh, if you're using data.table, these would be a series of strange symbols. Um, you would use like a, a colon equals, I think. No. It's not a colon. But you use a, a series of uh, symbols to essentially do this. In tidy, it's language. And the goal is to actually use the Magritter pipe as uh, the word then. So we would say, my t in this case, my table gets the existing my table uh, and then mutate so that the value p equals uh, x times y, and then take that data set and summarize the mean of p. So we can translate that into human language much more easily than we can with base R or with other systems. So that's, that's why we use Magritter. Um, and for this, for this coming project, you're going to need to uh, do a, a fair bit of that. Best practices, I, already, I just mentioned a little bit, but be a little more explicit about it. On the first line, if you're going to do variable assignment, do variable assignment, and also show the source of the data. This doesn't have to be the name of a data file. This could be like read underscore CSV. You could import on line one and then do other stuff as you go. Um, but the important part is this first line only contains those two pieces of information. One, uh, wherever you're saving it, if you're saving it, and you don't have to, remember, you can just print it back to the console. And two, whatever the initial source of data for that series of pipes will be. Uh, this is important for the project because I'm giving you line lists of line numbers, uh, which um, we'll talk more about later. But if you don't do that, you may find you don't have enough lines. <laughs> so please make sure you do that. Uh, best practice number two is uh, that you're going to indent one tab over for your series, uh, like I just did in R. Uh, you can see I have, imp I have indented one set for each thing that comes after that point. Uh, and three, try not to nest verbs inside each other. You could, for example, put... Uh, Inside mean x, instead of summarize, you could put another, you could like put the filter inside summarize. You can do that. It would work. Don't do that. Try to use one verb per line. There is almost always a way to use a single verb per line when you're creating these uh, pipe chains. Uh, so don't, don't do that. 
Uh, yeah, remember you don't need to do variable assignment if you don't need that information later in your code. Uh, here's an example not using variable assignment. So our source of our data in this case is old tibble, uh, and, we are, uh, and then filtering it such that where uh, cases where x equals 1, and then we're summarizing the mean of x for remaining cases. Uh, in this case, uh, we are storing that information into new tibble, but either way, this is the kind of form you want. Uh, McGritter actually has a huge number more of these. If you really like this idea of piping things together in unique ways, McGritter has a whole series of different kinds of pipes that do different things. But in here, we're going to just focus on the single uh, assignment pipe, uh, or the single passing pipe that does uh, from left to right side. Okay. Other things that you can do within dplyr that are important is grouping. Uh, you want to use the group by verb to do that, but importantly, groups do not subset. Uh, I think it's intuitive when you first learn dplyr to think that when you group something, it's going to create summary variables of your groups, but it doesn't. All it does is it implicitly states that group exists, or that groups exist. If I take my tibble and assign back... Uh, my tibble group by, oh, I can't do that in my tibble because I destroyed my tibble. Whoops, we'll do it in my DF. So my tibble is now going to become my DF, and I'm going to group by ZZZ. If I look at my tibble now, nothing has actually changed, but these groups have been defined implicitly here. You can think of that, the equivalent in SPSS, as split file. When you hit split file, nothing actually changes, but every time you do an analysis, it ends up getting split into whatever you split the file by. So this is the same idea. If I, at this point, do summarize, it's going to give me separate output for the two groups defined in Z. So important, though, it's implicit. It doesn't actually split your file up anyway. It just tells you, oh, hey, if you do any analyses later that call for grouping or that are changed by grouping, use these groups. That's what group by does. And we could probably actually show an example of that right now. If I do mean of y, y, y. Oh, can't spell the day. There we go. And it automatically detects, uh, which is a convenient part of this, uh, it automatically pulls back your group identifier, and then it returns back uh, this guy too. Uh, and I think you can actually return back uh, anything that is group consistent. No. Yeah, there's a way to uh, to look at distinct values, which actually might be distinct. We're going a little off script here. No, nah. There's a way to uh, pull back that information that's also grouped by. I mean, I, alternatively, I could have just uh, actually grouped by, I guess. Yeah, that would do the same thing. There's a way to uh, specify that in the, the summarize command. I just I'm not remember what it is at the moment. Um, but you can also just group by that same thing, and it'll spit it back out. So it'll automatically detect if there's overlaps, and it will create cross-tabulation if cross-tabulation is necessary. Uh, so it's also a really convenient way to look to see how many, uh, for example, if you did like a two-by-two two between subject design, this would be a convenient way to get your sample sizes real quick um, and see exactly who's in each group. Uh, and then get summary statistics by group. So uh, that's how you would do that. Uh, databases. Well, I only talked very briefly uh, in Data Camp about databases. I've actually explicitly did not assign you the Data Camp lessons on databases. Um, this is getting pretty deep data science-y. Again, remember, most data scientists, when they're working, are working with big website databases. Most of the people that do like big data scale data science are doing things like, let's see if we can identify patterns and purchase histories on Amazon which is literally millions and billions of cases. Uh, so they have to use a different file structure. Uh, the file structure we typically use, this tidy format, is just rows and columns. Uh, but that's not how data are represented in the wild. If you try to download data from a website and it comes back as a tidy data set, that's because they've done work for you to make that happen. Usually data are, actually, are instead stored uh, using this concept of keying, uh, this idea that every single data set that references anything in a database has to itself be flat, which means that there is no replication within the data set. So in this case, this is an example of what might be a simple, a very simple 
uh, website that collects data via surveys, you would probably have at least these three tables. Respondent DF, which has an identifier for each person that takes a survey, as well as their name. The name is unique to Respondent DF, so it doesn't get referenced anywhere else, but that response ID will end up being used over here. We'll get to that in a second. You then have a questions table, which has a question ID number that references each question on your test, the specific text and the specific responses possible in it. Uh, then you might have another answers table that, that cross-references those things. So the answers table tells you, well, for question number whatever, and this ID number is, gonna, is essentially a case number. It's going to increment across uh, forever. So if you had uh, 200 questions on your survey, then this would be 1 through 200. If you had a website that had hundreds of people doing that, that could be 1 through 200,000, and you'd just be getting individual pieces of it. Then this QID and this RID together are where the response variable is saved. Now this is even now super simple and not how this would really work. Uh, because Q responses right here would also be a keyed table, you would need to say for, in, for question one, here is the text for item one, here is the text for item two, here is the text for item three, or for response three, here is the text for response four, here is the text for response five. Uh, you might uh, also then have an extra column to indicate one, two, three, four, five, or whatever numbers you specified, etc. All of this, what I'm describing to you right now, is what's called a schema, which is a way of organizing a database so that you have a very consistent setup like this, where primary keys are unique identifiers only found in one place in the entire data set uniquely, and then are referenced as secondary identifiers in other tables. So whenever you, you'll be in this situation, I can promise you, if you are, whether you're academic or uh, applied and whatever field you're in, you will have to work with ITS or IT at some point to get data. This is what they're doing. They're figuring out how to navigate a database schema like this one to figure out what you want. So if you say something like, you know what, I just want to have all of the answers to this survey, this is another survey example, all the answers to this survey um, by everybody that was in uh, the June data collection effort for my project. Well, what they have to do is spot, well, where's the group identifier? Where are the questions that were on your particular survey? How are they recorded? Where are the answers located? What are their keys? And where are uh, the specific sections that I'm interested in? And how does this all relate back to the overall survey IDs? And craft a series of joins to get all of that information into one data set. That's what they're doing. So you usually don't do that because we usually work with relatively simple data sets. In comparison to this, the data science space, uh, social science data sets are easy. They are very simple because we usually get back what are already tidy data. The emphasis on tidy data is because this is how data are, u are usually represented. This is what data in the wild look like. So if someone has to translate this down, there's man hours involved in doing that. They have to figure out, well, how do I craft exactly the join statement that this person wants? And that's also why if you make a request and then uh, a week later contact IT and say, oh, that wasn't exactly what I wanted, I really meant to say this, they will be really mad at you <laughs> because they have to refigure out this whole schema and it takes them a lot of time. So this is what this is the under the hood look. This is a database schema. Uh, this, the things that you need to remember for now is this idea of keying. Uh, primary keys, these unique identifiers, and these secondary keys, these non-unique identifiers, uh, that are contained in each table, and that each table contains primary keys. We will work with slightly more complicated multi-level data sets later in the course. Uh, you won't have to deal with anything of quite this scope, uh, but we will do some pretty complicated joins uh, later down the road. So just keep, keep that all in mind, and remember that exists uh, for later. So, joins. Joins are a, uh, the way that you combine data sets with uh, different structures. If you have different variables, different cases, uh, or, just, uh, or just different variables, uh, then you're going to be using joins in order to pull them together. The difference between all of the joins is what is treated as a key, so what does it get matched on, and then what gets dropped. So inner join, left join, right join, uh, outer joins, and I guess they're called full joins in, in uh, dplyr. Uh, and uh, filtering joins, those are all just specifying different ways to combine two data sets uh, with different assumptions. You should always think about them explicitly in terms of the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the equation. 
Okay? If you're doing a left join, you're taking left hand side and adding right side to it. If you're doing a right hand join, you're taking right hand side and adding left side to it. If you're doing an inner join, you're taking left and right hand side together. If you're doing an outer join, you're taking everybody from left hand, right side, and right hand side. That's a common way to, to think about it, and I would recommend it. Uh, and uh, they're always phrased that way, left hand side first. Common mistakes with joins, even though we are in tidyverse, the by statement in a join takes a character vector. That's a real common thing to forget because you are like, oh, I've just been referring to all these variables just by typing their name out. When you do a join, it needs a character vector specifically. So if you just type it in using quasi notation, like for example, if I do uh, left join my, this won't work, so I'm not even going to try it, but left hand side on right hand side uh, by equals my variable. That intuitively makes sense to you because you look up here and you're like, oh, I've been using quasi notation up here. I haven't been using quotes. I haven't been using anything else. That will break in a join. So in join specifically, you got to use quotes around your variables. Uh, and part of that is because you can join by multiple variables simultaneously. So you need to have a whole character vector uh, of, of items there. Technical reasons aren't important. Uh, but yeah, that's the, a, co a really common mistake in joins. So if you find your join isn't working, that is often the cause. Mutating joins are the main kind of join that you will do. We have left joins, right joins, inner joins, and full joins. Full joins are also called outer joins. You'll see that a lot. Or sometimes full outer joins, same thing. Uh, Left-hand jo join takes left-hand side, adds columns from the right-hand sides, and for rows on the right-hand side where the left-hand side key is missing, drop the rows. Left-hand side joins are probably the most common type you're going to do when you have extra information that is organized differently. So say, for example, you had seven data collection efforts, and you had them all in one file, and then you had a notes file for your seven data collection efforts that has seven rows in it. Well, then what you would do is you would left join, because what it'll do is it'll say for every row in the left-hand side, find the match on the right-hand side and copy that one row over, over and over and over and over again. Right-hand side does the same thing, just in reverse. Um, the only reason you would ever want to use a right join is if you already have a McGritter pipe that leads you to need it. Otherwise, left-hand join is more likely what you're going to be using. Uh, inner joins take everything that has that have values in both sides. So uh, it will do independent, unique matches uh, and non-unique matches uh, in certain cases uh, where you have a key in, the, in both tables. So this is most useful. Uh, inner joins are most useful when you have two data sets that have the same participants in them, but different variables. So an inner join will combine them all together. You don't want to do a left join in that context because then you're going to end up with data sets on your left-hand side that don't have, ver don't have data on the right-hand side. Or vice versa if you do a right-hand join. Uh, full joins take everything. Uh, this is also a really common thing to do if you want to have excellent control over data loss because what a full join will do is it will take everything from both sides. So you will end up with NAs if there are cases missing from one side but not the other. So if you have data file one, data file two, they have all the same people in them, and you do a full outer join, and somebody was only in data file one, their variable values for two will have NAs in them, uh, and vice versa will be true uh, as well. So one of those two is, one of those three is most likely what you're going to need depending on uh, the specific task you're trying to accomplish. So yeah. Left join, right join, most useful when you are adding variables uh, from a different level file. If you do multi-level modeling, uh, it's also like HLM, that's also a good context for it, because you might have level two variables and you want to add all of your level two variables to your level one data set. That would be a good example of a left-hand join. Uh, whereas for inner and full, that's when you have one row per case in both data files and the same people in both data sets. You just want to smush them together. Now, also have filtering joins. You're not going to do a lot of these, most likely, um, but it's good to know they exist. Semi joins, where you perform a left join but run only rows and columns from the left hand side to match rows on the right hand side. Uh, that is essentially saying, unless the case exists in the right hand side, I don't want to know about it. That's all that means. And then the anti join, which is performing a left join but then only returning rows that did not match. I will say anti-joins can be useful to try to figure out where you are missing data. If you, instead of doing a full outer join and then filtering by NA, you can just do an anti-join and get a list of all your problem cases. That's also a pretty common use for it. Um, but you can do it just as easily with the NA filtering if that's easier for you. Uh, I find filtering joins not very intuitive, personally. Um, but uh, they are useful for those purposes if you want to use them. 
Uh, but yeah, you can recreate both of those using combinations of other functions. So you don't actually need those functions. Uh, you can do them other ways. We also have set operations, uh, union, intersect, and set diff. Union is the one you're going to use most often. Uh, this occurs when you're combining multiply, uh, multiple identical data sets in terms of variables, but they have extra cases. Uh, the advantage of using union uh, is that it will actually match up the variables correctly. Uh, that can be, say for example, you, you had two Excel files where you had data for some reason, and in one case, two of your variables flipped order. But the headings were right. If you use, if you just uh, row bind, if you do bind rows or uh, R bind on that, uh, they will not necessarily match up right because they will. It will gently just say, "Oh, it's just a new row of data," and just stick it on there. Whereas Union will actually try to uh, keep track of all that information for you of where the variable names are. Um, the advantage to Union also is it will only return unique rows. Uh, this is really the part a particular advantage to using Union uh, is that in that. Um, uh, if you have multiple data files collected over multiple points that have overlaps, uh, say for example you are um, you had some sort of data problem and you have multiple files that uh, have non-distinct cases in them, so you might have you know participants one through five hundred in this file and two hundred and fifty through six hundred in this file, but the orders are all wrong and you're not sure where everybody is. Union will automatically just do all that filtering out for you. Uh, however, you can still do bind rows and then use distinct afterwards. So it's just another way to do the same thing. Uh, and again, remember, language. So there's a lot of different ways to do things at this point. Uh, intersect identify rows that are identical between data sets. Uh, set diff identifies rows that are different between the data sets. For our purposes in the social science context, not real common that you need that um, because it's, it's specifically looking for identical rows. Uh, most often we need joins. Most often we want to see, does this person exist in this other file? Not, does this person and all of their data also exist as a person and all of their data in this other file? So we don't need those two so much. Uh, set equal and identical are just two ways to check if two, two data sets are the same. Good to know they exist, but also not very common for our purposes. For uh, raw data manipulation, uh, you really should be using bind rows or union, depending on the context, instead of our bind. Uh, and bind calls instead of cbind. You honestly don't really want to use uh, bind calls at all if you can avoid it. Um, the major difference between bind calls and a join is that bind calls just sticks the data there. So it assumes you've already worked out all the details, that the data are in the order you think they are, that all the formats are correct, that everything will line up just perfectly. If, if, that, if that's not true, uh, then you will not be able to use bind calls appropriately. So bind calls then becomes most useful in uh, data frame manipulations. Like if you're transposing data sets and you're flipping things around and you're changing stuff and you know 100%, like without any doubt whatsoever that that is correctly formatted, then use bind calls. But in most cases you don't. In most cases you're going to need to use a key join. Uh, binding rows can be useful, uh, especially in this context. This guy right here is the number one reason to use bind rows instead of using uh, union, is that you're able to specify the source data frames and then combine them and create a new variable that identifies where they came from. That is super useful. Um, if you, are, uh, if you uh, do mechanical Turk work, for example, where you might end up with like 20 different data sets from different data collection efforts, uh, if you do session-oriented work where you have some, a participant come in three different times uh, for data collection, those are stored in different files, all of that, those are all ways that you can uh, combine data in a, very, in a useful way with these identifiers. And you'll actually need that for the project, too. So this is, yeah, this is a super useful use of uh, uh, bind rows. All right. So I said uh, at the um, beginning that there would be a warning, and I've alluded to it a couple times. dplyr is the first package that we've used in here that is under active frequent development. What that means is that the new versions of dplyr and new versions of tidyverse can be released at any time and they can break code that you've already written because they change something. In general, we rely on the kindness of package maintainers for that not to happen. Uh, but they don't have to. They can totally change it tomorrow and we would all have to adapt. This has happened to a degree already in DataCamp. Several of the functions that are referenced in there uh, are not really the preferred way to do things, although they do work. Uh, the data wrangling cheat sheet is a particular problem uh, because several kings in here uh, 
Uh, mutate each, for example, you shouldn't use anymore. Mutate each is actually going to be removed from dplyr completely within uh, a couple of versions. The term for this is deprecated, right here. If you try to use a function and it says this function is deprecated, that is the package maintainer warning you that somewhere soon in the future, I am getting rid of this, and you should figure out the better way to do it. If the package maintainer is nice, then they will also give you instructions when that warning appears as to what the replacement function is. So if, for example, you try to use mutate each, actually, I might be able to do it right now. Uh, if you try to use mutate each, it will give you a warning uh, and tell you, I mean, actually, I have to give it something to make it show the warning, though. Uh, there we go. So it will give you this warning, mutate each is deprecated, use mutate all, mutate add, or mutate if. And this is the trigger for you if you were previously using mutate each to say, oh crap, I need to go look in the documentation to figure out what these things are. So as we use more and more modern, currently maintained packages, this will happen more often. Uh, you really need to pay attention to those warnings. No warning and no error should ever be passed in R. If you see a warning, you see an error, you need to read it and try to figure out what it's trying to tell you. The reason that they stay in there, though, is called backwards compatibility. This idea that if a function's been deprecated, uh, you should still have access to it for a while so that it's not like you update dplyr and everything breaks. Dplyr, uh, or the deprecation warnings are there specifically to give you a backwards compatibility window where your code will still work, but another update or two from now, it might stop. So pay attention to those. You can stay up to date on packages. Uh, you can use the news command in R to get an update on what's actually changed about base R. Base R doesn't typically change a lot, but it does change. Uh, and anytime that you update R, uh, you should probably just glance through this list of changes to make sure that nothing that's in there is related to something you're doing. Um, most of these are going to be relatively small bug fixes. There's usually not huge changes to um, base R, but that's not always true. Uh, then we have, you can also do this for packages, doing news parentheses package equals package name. However, this also relies on the package maintainer being a nice person and literally right. And you'll find for a lot of packages that's not true. Google is your friend. You should use Google uh, to keep track of these things. That's it.